Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you all can see me well. I hope that you can hear me well. And on behalf of all of Guangzhou International Center, I welcome you to another GIC talk. I hope you all had a tasty lunch that you are resting now. As we all know, the holidays, Tusa holiday is coming. So for some of us, for some of you, <laughs> I hope that the holidays already started and that you are enjoying. Our today's talk is another unique experience sharing. Today, we are talking about studying abroad the best of experiences and our speaker is David Richter. So growing up, David wanted to stay in his hometown forever. It never even occurred to him that one day he could end up anywhere outside of that region. But then he started to learn English through the influence of American television and his growing interest in American football. After starting college, he decided to do a semester abroad in the U.S. His present presentation today, his GIC talk, will tell us the story of how going to the U.S. led to attending multiple studies abroad and the whole experience that came with it. So I am really looking forward to hearing all about this, having had the experience of being a foreign student myself. But as you know, every experience is unique. So now I would like to say hello to David. Hi. Hello. Hello. You Thank me? you for accepting to do the GIC talk today. And without further ado, I guess everyone is really, really excited to hear what you have to share with us today. So I will just hang over the mic and camera and everything to you, David. See all you right. Later. I'm gonna I'm gonna try sharing my screen again. Um, hope it it works. All right. Yes, it's perfect. It's right, perfect. perfect. Um, Sorry to interrupt you. I would just add one tiny thing. Sorry, this is usually part of my introduction. Please, everyone, throughout the presentation, keep your microphones muted. Keep your cameras on if you feel comfortable. If you have questions as they come, uh, just please type them in the chat room. And once uh, David's presentation is over, we will have, as always, a short Q&A session. Now I'm really going off. David, please start. All right. Uh, okay, so welcome everyone. Um, my name, like uh, Jana already said, my name is David Richter. I am a German citizen. I was born and raised in Germany, and I am currently in uh, in Chicago, in the United States. So for me, lunch has already long passed. Right now, it's twelve thirty a.m. Um, so I'm just hoping that I'm not waking up my roommates right now. Um, my talk focuses on my study abroad experiences. Um, like it was just mentioned. Um, I grew up in Germany and I, I, when I was growing up, I never planned to ever go abroad or go abroad for a longer time. Um, but that has all changed. And I want to kind of tell the story of why that changed and the reasons why I think studying abroad is something that a lot of people should probably consider, even though I might be talking to a lot of people that already have done that or already have plans to do it. But maybe I can just um, either um, remind you of some good memories or give you a few more reasons why study abroad might be a really good reason or why study abroad is a really good thing to do. Um, so my experience, um, like I said, I grew up in Germany. Um, this is where I grew up. So it's, it looks very nice um, and I still miss it there. And, and growing up here was always great. It, I, I really enjoyed it here. Um, and like, like it was mentioned before, when I grew up, I, I didn't plan to ever go anywhere else. Um, I was sure I was just gonna stay in this region and um, grow old and just enjoy my time in the countryside. Um, so yeah, you cannot see my house right here, but it's it's about like a five minute walk from, from this picture. Um, and like I said, I, I never planned to really leave. I, I went to high school in this area. I went to university in this area. Um, but at some point um, I, I started to actually, once I, once I got into high school, I, I became a lot more interested in stuff that was also not part of my region, stuff that was um, maybe just in other parts of Germany or just international things. and. Um, when I was in, up until seventh grade, I was always really, really bad at English. I was awful at English. So I, I had the great idea. I could, I could tell my parents that I'm going to start watching American TV shows in English now. So that way I could watch a lot more TV and my parents would think I would be learning. And I also just liked the idea of, of giving it a shot. And it actually turned out to help me quite a lot. Um, my English got a lot better through it, but also I just got confronted with a lot of 
American culture and American just pop culture and, and the American way of, of living. And the more I watched these TV shows, the more I also just felt like I wanted to experience it firsthand. So I watched a lot of shows like Scrubs and How I Met Your Mother and Friends. And they just really want, wanted, or I just really wanted to um, experience what all these characters that I was watching pretty much every single day, I just wanted to live a life that was kind of similar to what I saw on the TV. So I decided that once I, once I started university that I was gonna um, try to figure out a way that I could do a, a semester abroad. Um, so I started to save some money. Um, and my parents also agreed that if I would be able to, to organize it, that they would help me financially. And so I did, once I started university, again, my, my German university is in this area as well. Um, I talked to my advisor, the advisor of my college, so the advisor of computer science. Um, he also was the study abroad advisor for um, the, the faculty of computer science. I talked to him that I wanted to go to the United States. And he advised me that I should go to a university that is called Purdue University Northwest. Um, which is a satellite campus of the main campus of Purdue, which is in West Lafayette. And that I did. So I, I applied for Purdue University Northwest. It was a very difficult process at, at the beginning because I had never really been abroad um, being in Europe. Of course, I had been to many different countries, but in Europe, it's quite different because in Europe, um, we have the Schengen Agreement. So if, if I want to go to Austria, which is very close to my home, because my home is all the way in the south of Germany, I can just get in the car, I, I sit in, I'm going to sit in the car for maybe 10 or 15 minutes and I will just be in Austria. There's not really a border. Um, you might not even notice that you're in a new country up until you maybe see like a few street signs that might look different or maybe there's a store that we don't have in Germany. But there are no borders. So going to the United States was a very new experience for me because I had to apply for a visa. I had to go through immigration. There was so much paperwork that I never had to do before. So the process um, started off very slow and, and honestly kind of painful. Um, but I got through it and then I managed to actually book a flight. I went to the United States. Um, I, I went to Chicago, which is um, where I am right now as well. And I started my one semester abroad at PNW. Um, at the time, I thought it was going to go like this. I was going to go to PNW. I was going to be there for six months. I'm going to check off going to the United States for, uh, for my bucket list and just re return back home. And just live the life that I had always thought I was going to live. I was just going to stay in Germany and um, find a job, just settle down. Um, and when I first went to PNW, I, it kind of seemed like it was going to be that way. Uh, things started off kind of slow. I went there pretty early. So when I got there, campus was still very empty. Um, I didn't really meet anybody for the first month. So it was always kind of boring. And I was, I was thinking to myself that, yeah, you know, I'll do this for six months. It'll be fine. And then once I return home, um, I can just, you know, like I said, take it off my bucket list. I, I have been to the United States. I have done what I always told myself I was going to do. And I can just finish my bachelor's and, and move on. Um, but as time went on, I started to actually meet my first American friends, which was really the thing that I wanted to do the most, just live a very ordinary life, um, make American friends, use my English that I had taught myself, you know, that I studied for really hard, use English as much as I can, and just, do all the things that I saw on TV and even more, just um, experience what it means to be um, in the United States in this case. Um, and that was my goal. And like I said, I met a few American friends pretty early on after the semester had actually started and things were going great. But then um, we had international student orientation. Um, and that is where I kind of, now that I think about it, it seems kind of stupid, but at the time I just didn't think about it much there were a lot more international students than I had thought. And they were from all over the world. I, I met people from Korea. I met people from Japan, from China, from Hong Kong. I met people from Saudi Arabia, from Brazil and all these other countries. And that was just incredibly interesting to me. And something, again, probably very naive, but something I just didn't really expect. I thought I was gonna, I was gonna go there. I was gonna be surrounded by Americans and, and just hang out with them. And it never occurred to me that I could just, you know, Get a chance to meet all these other people as well and then at orientation i got um, to meet my first few friends and those were um, a friend from japan and from south korea and in the beginning i was a bit skeptical because i i wanted to you know live specifically the american um, college life that i had seen on tv um, but i was after i thought about it for a bit and after i just got to know these people i was very much open to 
you know, just meet all these other people from all over the world as well, which is just this great chance that I might never have again. Um, because, you know, when am I ever going to have a chance to just um, be on a campus with all these people from all over the world and just learn about their cultures, learn about their upbringing, learn about their countries and, and all that um, stuff that is really, really interesting. Um, so as the semester went on, I got to know a lot of people and I, I made really, really good friends. I still talk to a lot of these friends almost every day. Um, we still we're still texting we're still calling sometimes some of the friends they um some of my friends that i made at the time they still live here and i still yeah i still um meet them almost every single day and a lot of these friends are also the reason why i'm doing this talk today but we're gonna get to that um a little bit later but yeah like i said i, I made very good american friends but also a lot of international friends and these are national friends they told me hey you should really come to japan and visit my my home i'm gonna you know I'm going to invite you and I'm going to show you around. You should really come to South Korea. We're going to show you everything that we know. And I did the same. I invited all these friends that I made to come to visit me in Germany. And it actually worked out. So I had um, friends from Japan. I had friends from Korea and I had friends from Hong Kong come to my hometown, stay at my house. And I was showing them Germany. I was showing them the, um, the southern side of Germany that I, that I grew up in. And it, it was amazing. And also a friend group of um, Korean students invited me to come to Korea. And that is my first time uh, that I actually really experienced Korea. I, I went to Korea. I stayed in Seoul for a few days. I spent most of my time in Gwangju because they were from Gwangju and they were students at Chonam National University, um, which also introduced me to that campus because that's where my friend stayed. They had a stu studio room right next to the campus. And then I also went to Jeju Island for a few days. Um, and then right after I came back, I had to kind of return um, to my German, German life. But one more thing that I um, realized at PNW is that while my plan was go there for six months, go heck back home to Germany and just kind of complete the chapter of being abroad for my life and basically, you know, just never doing it again, just having that as something that I had completed, that was the absolute opposite. So I went back home to Germany and instead of being able to say, hey, I have finished this chapter in my life that, that is study abroad, um, that chapter only really began because I knew that, that, was, that those six months were the best six months that I had ever had in my life. And I really needed to do it again. So my plan was that I was going to return to PNW as a master's student once I graduated from, from my university with an undergraduate degree. Um, so that became my plan. And I, I worked towards it. I had talked to the professors. I had everything planned. And then once I was in my last semester in my undergrad program back in Germany, um, I had to write my thesis because in Germany, every student has to write a thesis to get there undergraduate degree. And I went to my professor and I asked him um, what kind of topics he has, what kind of research I could do for my thesis. And he offered me a position at Michigan State University, which is something I had no, I, I didn't really know that was um, even possible. And then once he um, talked to me about it, it was a topic that I had no experience in. So I was very anxious about the topic itself. It sounded very difficult. Also, it was at a university that I didn't know anybody there, and it was just a completely new um, university. And also, it sounded very expensive. So at, at first, I just told him that it's probably nothing for me. I, I can't afford it, and I, you know, I, I have to save money so I can do my master's degree at PNW. Um, so I at first kind of brushed it off. But then as, as, as things progressed, I, I found out that um, the professor and the postdoc that were working at this on, um, on the same research project, they would be helping me a lot in terms of just the materials. So that kind of um, made it a bit easier for me to feel like I might actually be able to achieve the goals that they had set for me. And also um, he told me, which was the most important part that um, Michigan State was actually gonna fund me. So they were gonna pay for my housing and they were also gonna pay, um, give me a monthly pay, uh, payment. Um, and once I found out that those two things were kind of checked off, I actually decided to agree. And I ended up going to Michigan State University for six months again, so that was, the PNW, my first experience was in 2016, and to MSU I went in 2018, so two years later. Um, so Michigan State was a very, very different experience for me. First off, they paid me what what was for me a lot of money. So I didn't at PNW I was really just scraping by. My bank account was always in the negative. I was just about making enough money to kind of survive. At Michigan State, I had more money than I had ever had in my life. So I was a lot freer in what I wanted to do, which was obviously great. Um, but also I, I was not a student, I was just working in research. So um, I had my own office, I was sitting in that office alone. I had my own apartment, I didn't have any roommates and I didn't take any classes. So in, in the beginning, it was very difficult to meet people, 
because I just had no interactions like a, a usual student would have. Usually you would have roommates, usually would, you would have classmates. I had none of that. So the, in the beginning, it was kind of slow and it took some time to actually meet friends. Um, and that's probably also due to the fact that the campus is just so huge. Michigan State, I think, in just in terms of size, is the biggest campus in the United States. And it also, in terms of students, it's one of the biggest universities here. Um, so it's just, you know, not as close-knit as a, a smaller campus like PNW would be, for example. And also, Michigan State is, in terms of ranking, one of the very high-ranking universities in the United States. So one thing um, that that kind of showed to me is that at PNW, um, the international program, they have field trips every week, they have cultural events all the time, they have all this different programming um, for international students because they are kind of a smaller school. So they probably really try hard to get international students to be interested in their campus. Whereas Michigan State, they just seem to be fine by their name. International students will come because the school has a big name. So the programming they had was also a bit um, on the cheaper end. They didn't really try so hard. So they only had what was called coffee hour. They just had a room. They had free coffee in that room. It was once a week and you could come and play board games. So the programming was very different. And personally, I didn't like it as much. Um, I really preferred PNW's programming, but um, due to the size of Michigan State, they had a few other things to offer. So they had a lot of sports. They had just this very, this typical big campus um, that you would see on American movies. They had college football, they had all these different sports and all that sort of stuff, which still made this stay very worthwhile. I, I still, to this day, prefer the stay that I had PNW, at PNW in 2016, but Michigan State was still a very, very good experience for me, also just in terms of personal growth. Um, after Michigan State was done, I, it was about time for me to go back to PNW if I actually got accepted. So that was kind of the time in my life where, or the time in, in my studies where um, I was just about to be done with my undergraduate degree and I really had to start applying and, and getting things finalized to go back for a master's degree. But with this, I'm going to call it newfound wealth, like this, this money that I, that I earned at Michigan State, which I was able to save a lot of it, um, I decided that it would be a great idea to just go back to South Korea because I was there just about a year ago and I really, really liked it. South Korea was a, a really, really fun place for me. Um, Germany and the United States are very different, but just slightly. But if, if you compare Germany to South Korea, everything is different, but by a lot. It's just, it's, it's so different. It was such a great experience for me. So I decided that I was going to take the money that I earned at Michigan State and go back to, to South Korea. But this time, I'm not just going to go to Korea to meet my, to visit my friends. I, I will still visit my friends, but I also want to um, take the chance and maybe do something more. So I decided to sign up for John M. National University's International Summer Session. Um, and at CNU, I tried to start to um, study some Korean to get some Korean language uh, skills. I had done a little bit of self-study before, but uh, it, it didn't work that well for me. I got like the very, very, very basics down, like saying hello, nice to meet you, but that's about it. And so I decided to go to CNU with the money that I had just saved and take Korean language courses at China National University, which I thought was really, really cool. I, I absolutely enjoyed my time there. Um, and it was an experience that I had never, again, just like MSU, I never really planned for it. Um, it just kind of happened. And like I said, I could save enough money. And then on top of the money that I had saved, I also got a scholarship to go. Um, so I, I, went, I went to CNU. Um, the program is only four weeks. I ended up staying for six weeks. I, I, I spent one week in Seoul, one week in, in, uh, in Jeju, and then the four weeks at, in Gwangju for the, um, for the program. And again, it was absolutely great. And, and just like at PNW the first time, while I thought this might be, you know, my, I have now been to Korea and I have been a student in Korea, check mark. It didn't really work that way. So I, I went there. And before the program was done, I, I thought to myself, man, I, I really like this. I have to come back. So ever since then, I've also thought and, and tried to plan a way that I could go back to um, Korea and more specifically to CNU and, and Gwangju. I really, really hope I can return one day. But after the program was done, it was time for me to start my master's degree. So I went back to PNW, the very first program that I did. I'm, I'm back at that school. That's where I am right now. I'm on the campus, um, sitting in the dorms right now. And I started my master's degree here. Um, overall, I, I really enjoyed it. It is a great experience. It's, it's what I wanted to do. I wanted to come here for a bit longer because while six months are very long, they also really don't feel that long. Um, so I always wanted to come here for at least one or two years. And that's what I'm doing right now. 
I'm going to be probably leaving in December, so my time is coming to an end. But I've been here for a few years now, and I still very much enjoy it. I don't think it's necessarily, um, it's not really living up to the standard of 2016, but a lot of that is also due to COVID, because obviously, um, not too long after I came here, the COVID pandemic started, and that makes study abroad a bit more difficult. So I had to go back home for six months during one of my semesters. I, I stayed home for a whole summer, which took away um, some of the time that I, I had to spend here. And also, campus was shut down for most of the time. And then a lot of stores were also shut down. And even after the US opened, I still tried to stay kind of stay a bit safer. Um, so I didn't do as much as I had wanted. And that kind of made me think, like, what else can I do? Because I'm, I'm in the US, I'm basically living the dream that I had for a few years now, but all I'm doing is sitting in my room and you know I, I might as well just be back home right now. The only thing that really changes is the food that I eat. Um, so I, I look for different alternatives. And while I couldn't go to Changnam again, which was also one of my plans that I could maybe go to CNU again, obviously with COVID that was also not possible. So I looked for alternatives and that is kind of the last step in my current study abroad experiences. So I signed up for a bunch of different programs for um, study abroad online. And the reason how that happened is one of my Korean friends, she started to work at uh, Dongguk University, which is a university in Seoul. And when she told me, I just said, hey, uh, you know, I'm interested. I'm going to look at your university website. And I saw that they had a, um, an online winner program where it's, I think, two weeks of classes. Um, it was pretty cheap, so I, I thought, you know what, I'll just sign up for it, why not? I don't have anything to do over the, the winter holidays, I'm stuck in my dorm room, um, COVID's happening outside, I might as well stay in here and learn a few things. So I signed up for the class that they had on Korean film. Um, it was a history of Korean film class, and it was, it was really fun. I didn't know what to expect, it was all online, and study abroad online, when thinking about it at first, right, it sounds kind of weird, because you're not actually going abroad, you're not actually in the country. Um, but I gave it a shot. And this class at Dongguk University was really, really fun. So I, I knew since I can't go to Cheonam again for the in-person summer session, I'm gonna do, um, and I'm gonna go online and just find summer sessions at different universities um, that I think are first off gonna help me and that just sound like they would be fun. And then I did, of course, I, I knew I was gonna go back to um, the CNU ISS. This one says 2020, but I went to the, the 2020 one was canceled altogether. I went to the 2021 version, which was also all online. This was the one I knew I was going to do. And then I looked for a few more. So I did one at um, Hankook University of Foreign Studies, Studies Hankook Rede in Seoul. And I did one at Hokkaido University in Japan. So this one, the one in Seoul, was also a language class. At Cheonam, I did the language class. And then in Hokkaido, I just did a class on my research topic. And I was also asked by my German university to teach at one of their summer schools. So I had four different summer schools lined up for the summer. Um, and that is what I did. And I, I again have to say, it might not be the same as studying abroad in person, um, but study abroad online is a really good alternative, I think. Um, and I'm going to get to that a little bit later, but it is something I would have never considered before COVID started. But I really do think it is a pretty cool experience. And, and again, I'm going to uh, focus on that a bit more, but I just want to point out that um, just because, you know, study abroad might not be possible right now, there's definitely alternatives. And I think they are. Uh, worth considering. All right, so all of that sounds super fun. Um, and all of this is super fun. But one thing you also have to consider is that study abroad comes with a lot of work. Study abroad isn't just all fun and games. There's a lot of work that's associated with it. And I'm just going to go over um, comparing what an international student has to do to come to the United States and study versus what a student with an American passport has to do, just to kind of um, point out how much work it actually is being an international student, at, at, uh, especially in the beginning. So if I'm an American student, I just have to um, go on the campus, meet my advisor, meet the uh, people in, in, in charge of um, admissions. I have to meet a certain GPA requirement. I apply. My high school is just going to send the transcript right to the school. I will probably sign up for um, financial aid, and I'm going to be good to go. I just take my classes. Or if I, I feel like I don't want to take a class for a semester, I can just not take the class. For international students, however, it's really not that easy. So as an international student, you also apply, but the application process is a bit longer. Um, you need to have translated or notarized paperwork. 
you need to have proof of financial stability even before you can apply you need to send passports that are maybe notarized or, or translated you're probably going to need some sort of motivation letters and just all this other sort of stuff you might have to send in your transcript notarized and translated um, um, and then even once once you're accepted that's not when you're done for an for an american student this would be the end of the journey and school would start but for a international student that's essentially just when it starts so you get accepted and you will get your I-20 form. That's what the I-20 form looks like. And the I-20 form has a CVIS ID. And that CVIS ID is the number that you need. So now you can start to finally apply for your visa and all the immigration documents. Um, once I have that CVIS ID, I can start on my DS-160, which is just pages upon pages of questions. And it's it's really difficult to do. The first time I did it, I it was a headache. I, it took me way too long. I didn't know what I was doing. There are so many pages they ask you for all your school experience starting in elementary school and they wanted to by the date it's not just enough if i you know if you say i started in 2006 they want to know i started on the 11th of august of 2006 for example and they ask the same about all your part-time jobs and they ask about all the social media and then there's also these questions which i always find a bit hilarious so i took a picture of them um for example um let's just take this here have you ever engaged in the recruitment or the use of child soldiers and there's there's probably like six, seven pages of questions like that, where it's like, do you currently take drugs? Do you plan to sell drugs while you're in the United States? Do you plan to sell illegal firearms when you're in the United States? Have you participated in genocide? It's just pages upon pages of these questions. And you would think you can just press no, but in the back of my mind, I'm always like, yeah. But what if they go double negative? What, what if instead of, have you ever engaged? What if they have asked, have you never engaged? And then I'm going to say no, and they're going to notice that I have not actually read the questions. <laughs> and then I'm going to be picked out as the person that doesn't get the visa. So um, there's all this, which is the DS-160. Then once you have that completed, um, you're going to get your next ID number, and you can pay them, and you can apply for a visit at the embassy because you need to also go through an interview. Um, so you have to fill out that out. After you've done that, you can pay them even, or not can, you have to pay them even more money and you will get a receipt number. And with that receipt number, you are now eligible to go to the embassy. Um, and then it is interview time. So now you have your date and then you can go to the closest embassy, which in my case, I live in the countryside, it's a two hour drive. So I have to wake up at 4 a.m., get in the car, drive to, the, to Munich for, to go to the embassy, wait in line. Then the interview takes like 10 seconds, maybe two minutes. Um, they just scan your fingertips. I think they, or your fingerprints, then I think they check if you speak enough English and then they just send you home again. However, they keep your passport. So you, you, they have to leave your passport at the embassy for however long it takes them to make a decision. And then if let's say it's, it takes about a week or two, you get your passport back, then you can start booking a plane, finding housing, registering for classes. But one thing that I have always found very, very difficult is that you never get to actually talk to anybody. You, you can maybe send emails if you find the right contact, but you can't just go to somebody's office. You can't just call someone because it's, you know, I'm in a different country, I'm in a, in a different time zone and calling somebody might be super expensive. Um, they might not have a Zoom or a Skype account set up for communication with international students. So it's always very difficult to actually get in touch with the right people. And even if you do, you know, it, you'll send them an email and maybe it takes, them, it takes them a week to reply. And it's just this game of just waiting and waiting and waiting. And maybe it's going to take you a month to get your answer. Whereas if you could have just gone there in person, if I would have just been able to walk into an office, it might have taken me like five minutes. Um, so that's always a very frustrating part of the entire process. After I arrive, I have to check in for CVIS. I'm going to print out and hand them in my I-94. I'm going to get a new I-20. I have to get insurance that covers a variety of different and crazy sounding um, requirements i and and then i am a fully registered student at this point i can you know start looking a bit outside of what being a student means i i might want to work right for example i need to work i can't afford studying in the us so i i had to find work um to support everything because i want to be able to pay for everything here um but if you want to have work you can only work on campus you cannot work off campus that means I can be the person that cleans the toilets on campus. That is perfectly fine. But I can, as a computer science student, I cannot do software development off campus, even though one relates to my major, the other one doesn't, that's not allowed. And I can also not work more than 20 hours. If I want to work, if I find a job, I, I can apply or I, I need to fill out an I-9 to get a social security number. Um, so that's also in, like a huge process of just getting that to work. And then some of the downsides, financial aid, 
which is available for American students is not available to international students and same goes for most scholarships. And then also international students have a lot of extra stuff that they have to do in terms of just everyday life. So for example, um, at this school in particular, there are a few vaccines that um, international students are mandated to have, whereas um, American students are not. And that's not the problem. Like I'm fine with taking the vaccines, but what I always found a bit annoying is that you have to have that vaccine taken in the United States. If I had the same vaccine, but I got it in Germany, they will not accept it, which I always thought was a bit strange. And then the last slide, I'm sorry, this is very, um, maybe stretching on a bit too long, but it's also just a bunch of stuff that you have to keep in mind as an international student. I really wanted to make that clear. But if you move, you have to let them know. If you get a new phone, you have to let them know if the phone number changes. If, if you get new insurance, if you get a new job, you always have to report it. If you don't, you might get into trouble. Um, if I want to just, you know, if, if I'm very stressed out, I only want to take one class this semester, I can't. Um, I have to be a full-time student, and if I'm not, I will be in bad standing and they will be able to deport me from the country. Um, there's only very specific cases where that doesn't work and that's the last semester. So if I only need one more class to graduate, then I can actually take less classes. Or if I have a doctor's notice that states that I'm specifically not in a condition where I can take more classes. But otherwise, if I just say I'm too stressed, I cannot take less classes. Um, I will be kicked out of the country. Same goes for grades. So if your grades don't match a certain threshold that the school sets, um, they also have the right to just um, drop you academically and send you back home. Um, and then after graduation, it's also a bit tricky because you can't just apply for a job. You have to apply for a visa extension, which is called OPT. You have to pay, I think, another $500 to actually apply for that extension, which then allows you to apply for jobs. And then that is only valid for three years. After that, you have to get yet another visa, which is called H-1B, which is like $2,500. Um, so it's always... It's just very, very tricky to get everything to work. Um, and, and lastly, um, if you go into any given office here, so if I want to get my driver's license, which would be outside of campus, or if I even if I just go on campus, but to an office that is not the international office, oftentimes people will give me advice that just isn't true because I'm an international student. So um, you always have to be very careful with which advice you take because a professor might just tell you, hey, you can just drop my class and take it next semester, you know, maybe that will be helpful for you, but I'm not allowed to do it because I need to be a full-time student. Um, so that's something to always keep in mind. And like I mentioned before, the worst part for me is always waiting. Just you have to wait for your CVS ID with the I-20. You have to wait for your visa to come back. You have to wait days for emails to get answered. And um, this whole process just takes, um, it, it, it takes a lot of patience because it might, I might just, I, I really might just need to know when my class starts. Like, is it 5 p.m. or is it 6 p.m.? But if the person doesn't answer me for a week, then this, I, I might have to wait a week for such a simple answer. Um, so that's always a bit, um, a bit rough. So why, why do all this? Why would I, why have I gone through all this paperwork and all this, you know, all these rules for so many times already? And why do I, honestly, I probably want to come back here again if I have the chance. Why, why would I do all of this? So for, for one, I brought a study that I found when I was researching for this presentation, and it was conducted among American students that went um, somewhere else, so American students that went abroad. And it just shows, I, I don't want to go in too deep into this because first off, I, time's kind of running low, and also I, it's, it's not that super important, but we can see that there's personal development, academic development, intercultural development, and career development. And essentially what I just want to show is that you can see that the numbers in the total column are extremely high, which just means that most students said that they benefited in all these um, different categories when studying abroad. They thought that studying abroad helped them in all these categories. And the only ones that are a little bit low are um, if they, if, if study abroad actually influenced their career. So the, the way that they wrote it in the paper is, for example, I, I'm a computer science student. I went to America and now all of a sudden I want to learn about American culture instead of computer science. Um, so that's a bit lower, um, but everything else, just personal and, and intercultural and academic um, commitment and development is very, very high. And I would agree, it, it has a very high impact. Um, so when I was researching, I also found something that I thought was really cool. Um, so a lot of people always say you should leave your comfort zone, um, but I saw in a TED talk that was on a similar topic that somebody said, maybe you don't have to leave your comfort zone. Maybe you can just find your new comfort zone. Maybe you are finding your comfort zone by going abroad. And for me, that really applies, I think. So when I heard that um, person mention this, 
I really thought that was a great, um, great statement because I really enjoyed here. And I also really enjoyed my time at CNU. And, and I don't think I was ever leaving my comfort. So maybe for the first week, it kind of feels like it. But essentially, I'm finding my new comfort zone. I'm very comfortable being here. And I'm very comfortable when I'm, when I'm in Korea now. And um, instead of leaving your comfort zone, maybe you're just expanding it, which I thought was really nice way of putting it. And I also have been sent a quote when I asked some of the people that I knew about their opinions. And it's, um, the quote is, the world is a book and those who do not travel read only one page, which I think for me is also very true. And it might also be true for a lot of you because if I would have not gone to PNW in 2016, my life would be extremely different. I've been living in the United States for two and a half years right now. I really want to go back to Korea. I wouldn't be holding this talk right now if, if um, if I wouldn't have taken the first step a few years ago. And, and I really think study abroad can have a very big impact. And of course, just because you study abroad once doesn't mean you're gonna be stuck in this loop where I am in right now, where I just wanna keep going and keep going. Um, but it definitely opens up so many more possibilities and, and things you might never even think about otherwise. Um, so now instead of the study, I'm gonna look at a few of the things that I think you can gain, that I personally feel like you can gain. I also asked some of my friends and some of the people at different international offices that I know um, about their, about their um, opinion. So what is there to gain? You know, why, why do I do all this paperwork? What can I actually gain from it? Well, one is independence. And of course, you can also gain independence when you're, you're, when you're in your home country. I personally always stayed at my parents' house when I was still in Germany. But even if I get a new apartment in Germany, it's a bit different because if my, you know, if, if the electricity goes out, I can call my dad and just ask him to come over and repair it. If I need a certain type of insurance, I can just ask my mom, which type of insurance should I get? Or, or you know, if, if I need to open a new bank account, I can just always ask family and friends. But coming into the United States, for example, I cannot ask anybody because none of my family lives here. None of my, none of my family has ever been here. So I actually have to sit down and, you know, figure everything out by myself. I need insurance. Well, I better find insurance. Otherwise, I'm just not going to be able to get it. Um, so independence, I think, is just on a on a very different level because even even if it's simple things like you know my mom sends me a recipe, I might just not be able to cook the recipe because I don't have the ingredients. So I just have to um, become very independent and just figure things out very much by myself. Um, new experiences, that's probably one of the more obvious ones because uh, you know I'm, I'm in a new country, a lot of things are different, and it's great. But also, um, new experiences this doesn't just include things in the United States. For me, it also included things like meeting Japanese students, meeting Korean students, um, and just like laying the path for me to go to South Korea, which I never had planned before I went to the United States. Then probably the biggest reason for me is um, friendships. So study abroad has, has given me some of the best friendships I have made in my life so far. Like I said, I still talk to many of my friends almost daily, um, even though they are in completely different countries and completely different time zones, I still, communicate with them a lot. And I really, really um, am glad that that is the case. And I really treasure those friendships. They are very dear to me. And um, again, that's one thing I would have never had if I would not have gone abroad. And then also cultural awareness, not just for the country that I'm going to. Like, of course, I've learned a lot of, about American culture, but I have also, but I, I already kind of knew about American culture before I came here because I watched TV shows, I read about it. I was interested in America. So of course I already knew about it, but um, just by being here and, and meeting all these other students, I have indirectly learned about Indian culture, about Saudi Arabian culture, about Brazilian culture, things that I never knew before and things I didn't expect to learn about and things I might've not looked up uh, upon because I wasn't really interested in those places before I met people from there. So I think, um, yeah, of course, you're gonna learn about the, the country that you go to, but there's just so much more you're gonna learn just from all the other students that are also gonna be on that campus. Um, connections and relationships. So this side is more personal and this side is probably a bit more career oriented. So connections and relationships, you're gonna meet professors in different countries. You're gonna meet people working in the industry in different countries. You're gonna um, just meet all these different people from all the programs I've done. I now know professors in Japan and Korea and Australia, countries where I've never even been just from this whole study abroad um, experience. I, I now have um, connections in other countries. And, and it's it's not just something that I did, it just happens with study abroad. So when you study abroad, you are gonna be able to make connections to countries, um, which makes it easier to come back because I'm back here for my master's now. And the second time around, it was much easier than the first time, just because I met these people, I knew who to talk to now, they knew me. Um, so connections are very important. I think life skills is a bit similar to the independence. So you're just gonna learn 
all these different things because you're going to have to do them. It's it, there's no easy way out. Like I said, I can't just, um, I cannot just ask my dad which insurance should I buy, but I have to actually sit down and figure it out. Um, new opportunities kind of is similar to the connections and relationships. So one of my new opportunities was going to South Korea. I never planned to do it before. I was a little bit interested in like the South Korea, North Korea political, um, political side of things and, and, and um, the, the, the um, history between them. But I never planned to go to South Korea. But because I went to the United States, I met friends and I, I got the chance to come here, which now has also impacted my life a lot. Um, education, what I mean by that is um, you're going to be able to take different classes. When I went to the United States, I took classes that my school didn't offer, but that I was really interested in. So, so I had the chance to take classes that to me were really interesting um, that I otherwise would never have been able to take, which I think is also really great. And then just one last point, which I personally don't care too much about, but hireability, uh, meaning some companies just really value it. If you can say I've spent so and so many years in another country, it might make the recruiters um, like your resume a bit more potentially. Um, going back to online classes really quick. So study abroad, like I said, has influenced me a lot and I just, it, it has become my favorite thing to do. Um, but now there are these online, um, these, these, these online classes that you can also take. And while again, I, I, I started calling them study abroad light because obviously you don't go to the country. Um, you're not as immersed into the culture as much as you would be if you actually went there, but there's also a bunch of upsides to them. And I kind of want to list these because, um, Maybe if you haven't studied abroad yet, and if you're not sure yet, maybe doing an online program first might be a good idea because it's gonna ease you into it. You're gonna have a lot of what study abroad is without really um, kind of taking some of the risks. So one of the big advantages of these online programs is that they are just so much cheaper. Um, you don't have to pay for a flight. You don't have to pay for housing. You don't have to pay for all these different things. You just pay only for tuition. And even the tuition is usually cheaper on these online programs. So I've taken um, some of the online programs I took were a hundred dollars and that's it and that's for college credits i get credits for that class i get to learn for maybe even a month but it, it's just so cheap otherwise it might cost a, a few thousand dollars um it is still a lot of fun and that's what i was worried about the most it was um can it still be fun engaging and immersive the answer is yes for example at cnu i was put into a group of of, of um in the buddy program and we still meet and text to this day we, we still meet every month and watch a movie together or just talk. Um, you can still meet friends and you, you can still um, really experience the country itself as well because um, they're going to try to, you know, the international office there is still very motivated to show you the country. So for example, CNU sent out a really big care package which had um, ingredients to make Korean food. We had, um, we made Korean stamps. We learned about Korean pop culture with K-pop. Um, and it really works. I, again, I was also very skeptical, but I can assure you study abroad online can also be very immersive. Um, another thing is it doesn't really take up time. It can be simultaneous. So if I go to Korea for a study abroad program, I have to take a month out of, let's say if I work full time, I have to take one month holidays. Or if I'm in university, I have to make sure that it fits my schedule. If I'm doing it online, it might just be two hours every evening. So I can take the class even though I'm still working I can do study abroad even though I'm still working. I can do study abroad even though I'm still in class at my at my home school. That's what I did um, with the Dongo class, for example, or the Japanese class, uh, the, Jap uh, the, the class at uh, Hokkaido University. Um, also, it's less commitment and it's more experimental because of all these reasons, I don't have to commit as much time, as much money, as much thought into this. It's not as much work because none of the paperwork applies. I don't have to fill out all these different forms because I don't actually travel to the country. So I'm much more willing to just try it. I would have never done the program at, at Hokkaido University if it would not have been online. I would have not gone on a plane to fly to Japan just for, for the fun of it. But with this whole online setting, I was willing to just take a shot, you know, like I said, pay $100 and try it out. If it doesn't work for me, of course, I don't want to lose $100, but I'm, I'm much more willing to, to make that, you know, to, to take that chance than I would be to get on a plane, figure out housing, get all these different visa documents done. I would have probably not done a lot of these programs that I did online if I had to go in person. And then the, the very obvious one, it's also possible to do them um, during extraordinary times like COVID-19. 
I really wanted to go back to Korea. I couldn't because of COVID, but because these online programs now exist, um, I just had a chance to still get the experience or the experience light, um, even though I couldn't, you know, even, I couldn't even leave my own apartment. I couldn't go grocery shopping, but I could take a class in South Korea, which is really cool. Like I can't go to the grocery store, store safely, but I can still um, do a study abroad in countries that I'm really interested in. And then just very briefly, because I've talked about why it's great this whole time, just very briefly, a few of the cons that I have heard. Um, I always hear that study abroad is not for everyone. I'm, I'm not always sure. I, I was in computer science, a lot of my friends, or I was actually the only person out of my, from all my classmates that went study abroad. Um, a lot of them were just skeptical. I still think that everybody can have fun when studying abroad, but I always respect it when they just say they're not that interested. Another big argument is culture shock. Um, for me personally, I never had culture shock because I've only traveled to countries where I was previously interested. So I already knew about the culture. So I like to call it culture overload because let's say I'm interested in Korea, right? So let's say I watch a Korean movie. I'm going to be exposed to Korean culture for two hours and then maybe I have Korean dinner. So it's another hour of Korean culture. But then I go back home to my German town, talk to my German friends, you know, and, and be done with it. But if, if I go to Korea for six weeks, then I cannot just turn off the Korean switch. I'm going to be exposed to the culture for 24 hours every single day. Even if I'm not shocked by it, it might just be a lot of it. So when I was in Jeju Island, for example, I had so much seafood. I never had seafood before in my life. And now all of a sudden I couldn't, there was just no other, I just had seafood and seafood and seafood. So um, I wasn't shocked by it, but for me, it was just a bit much at, at all at once. Um, so in the beginning, you might experience either culture shock or culture overload. But for me so far, it has always subsided, just died out and it was great right after. Um, you're gonna stick out. So when I go to the United States, it's, it's not so much for me because um, I'm Caucasian, so I kind of fit in here. But when I went to Korea, I, I stuck out quite a lot. Um, I'm pretty tall, I'm, I'm two meters tall. So when I walk through Gwangju, a lot of people just you know stare at me or kind of point at me, which is sometimes a bit of a strange feeling, but... Um, it still wouldn't stop me from going abroad. I, I sometimes feel a bit weird when that happens, but it's something that I'm very much willing to pay the price and, and, and still um, keep on going. Um, homesickness is also one big reason that a lot of people have. I don't really think I need to explain that. Um, loneliness, it depends. A lot of people go study abroad with their friends together. I always try to go alone because that way I'm actually forced to be outgoing and forced to meet people and interact with the, um, the population in that place. So sometimes you just feel lonely. It, it happens to me as well. And then also the language barrier. Again, one I don't really experience when I come to the United States. But when I go to Korea, my Korean is still very bad. <laughs> so um, whenever I go to Korea, or when I go to Korea again, I'm still going to have the language barrier, which can also sometimes be a bit disheartening, a bit um, a bit worrying when you just go about and you just can't communicate with people the way you want to. And then very very lastly, and I promise that's the last um, second to last slide and the last line of, of text. Um, sometimes, like for me as well, people have dreamed about going abroad and doing study abroad for years. So they have all these different imaginations, like, oh, it's going to be great. I'm going to be doing this and this, and every day I will do this. And I'm going to meet all these different friends. And when you have like these super high expectations, um, it's going to be difficult to meet them. Even if the program is, is, is great. And if everything is, is perfectly fine, if you just keep, if you stick to those high expectations, um, it might not seem that great because you're like, ah, oh, you know, but I, I really wanted to do this one thing and I really wanted to, this one, to do this exact thing. So I, and I had that before. I, I did that. I, I'm, I'm guilty of that. When I went to CNU the first time, I had very high expectations. I had all these different plans, but I have since learned that sometimes, or most of the time, it's probably better to, it's great to have expectations, but to just be more patient and maybe not so strict with them because all you can do is get disappointed or meet your expectations. But if you kind of lower the standard a bit, um, it's a lot more fun. So that's just one advice I would have. Just even if you have high expectations, if you're super excited, don't try to um, be too uptight with them and just be a bit more lenient. Um, and then just for me personally, wh what does my future hold? That's just more of a last personal slide. Um, and the answer is I'm not really sure yet. I, I, I'm thinking about maybe doing a PhD, maybe doing it in the United States. I still very much want to go to South Korea again. And if I can, I really want to go to CNU again and be a student there. I still think I will go to Germany again at some point in my life. And then now that I started the summer school at Hokkaido, 
maybe Japan, but mostly here on the left side. That's kind of where where I see myself going again, as long as I have, um, as long as I can find a way that I can finance it myself and um, find a program that actually makes sense for me. And that is my last slide. So um, I think now I'm ready to take any questions if anybody has any. And this is where I come back. Thank you, David, for your amazing presentation. I genuinely enjoyed it. And I absolutely, it's, it's stunning how like starting with something as simple as like, oh, right, I'm going to watch these TV shows. I'm going to study English actually took you over three continents, like from Europe to America to Asia. Wow, really impressive. I was really happy. Really I mean, impressive. I was really happy. Okay, what happened to me? Why am I echoing? Okay, sorry, pardon, pardon <laughs> me. There was an echo for a moment. So, okay, first let me take a look at the chat room. Okay, we have some comments here. So, yes. If you have any questions, please, you can type them in the chat room now, or you can maybe, if you feel um, more comfortable like that, just like raise your hand or unmute yourself and uh, ask the question directly. Or if you found yourself or you are actually opposing to something that, that David just introduced about studying abroad, or you just want to share your own experience, like, yes, it felt the same for me, or no, when I went to America, it was completely different for me. You can also unmute yourself and just um, share your experience. So the comment that we have from Meline, I find the US rules for international students a bit harsh. Okay, that's interesting. Do you have something to say about that, David? Um, you... Well, I'm, I'm only used to them because when I went to Korea, I didn't need a visa. So it was a bit different. It was only a very short program. So mm -hmm. the US rules are just the only rules that I'm used to, but I, I agree that they are pretty harsh and they're not very forgiving. There's usually, if something goes wrong, the international office might still be able to find a way to fix things, but just overall, it's not very lenient. So they're very strict. There's very harsh rules um, for, like I said, working and all that. Um, reporting and that sort of stuff so yeah I see yes every country is different when it comes to that I can say as, as since I was the uh, international student in Korea first before I started working here but also it was I found it so interesting when you said you know about that form and you were saying you know I just wanted to tick them all no but what if the wording was wrong and now I remember <laughs> Yes, that's actually smart thinking probably halfway through I would have just given up and started saying oh no 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 but Right? What if they change the wording? Have you never, like, <laughs> I don't remember what was the question, but that was really, really uh, a good comment. Okay, we are getting, I will stop talking now because we're getting more questions. We have another comment from uh, Santak Nim. Thank you for good information. I'm like, thumbs up. And now we have a question from Taegyong Moon first. What was the most challenging situation studying abroad? Hmm. I think for me, it's probably, first of all, the most challenging was really my first, the, the first time I went to the United States, it was the application process because mm -hmm. um, for most of these programs, I was always the first one for my university to go. So nobody else from my university had ever gone to PNW, nobody had ever gone to MSU or CNU. Um, so I had, all, I had to really kind of do most of it by myself because we didn't know who should I email or where can I get the I-20 document from. Um, so I think really the, before you get there, the communication is very, very difficult because if you don't know who to send the email to, then you're just, you know, you send it to the wrong person, the wrong person's going to say, you should text this person. But then that person says, well, actually I'm not the right person. You should go here. And then you're just in a loop of just figuring, trying to figure out where to go. And, and, um, and then also when you're just not, now I'm a bit more relaxed about it because I know how it works. But in the beginning I was just so stressed because, um, I didn't, for example, I didn't get uh, accepted into housing until two days before I got my flight uh -huh. and it's just these different things which now I'm more relaxed about because I know how they work but the first time um, filling out the documents making sure that they're right then going to the interview and all that stuff just the I think the entire application process was probably the most difficult because once I got to the countries it's a lot of fun but before it's a lot of a lot of work um, so I think for me the most challenging is usually um, getting everything to getting everything figured out and getting everything to work. And then maybe saying goodbye at the end is also quite challenging when you have to realize that, okay, you know, 
I have to leave in four weeks. You know, I, I really want to do something else, but maybe I just, you know, so it's, it, that's also very challenging. Just accepting that um, everything that you've done for the last six months is just going to end and you just have to leave, even though you really don't want to. Yes, that's definitely not easy. Thank you for your answer, David. And thank you for the question. Take your <laughs> one. I can, I can also relate to this one. I'm sorry that I'm also, <laughs> I need to just little, little by little add in my own experience. Yeah, yeah please. Because it, um, when I was first coming to Korea, I literally got the final translation of my transcript that I had to bring with me two hours before I got <laughs> on the plane. The, something similar to like, I would yeah. be freaking out absolutely if I didn't have any information about the housing, as you just said, like getting it two days ahead. But yes, I was just wondering, I need to take this transcript with me, but the official translation is not over. So two hours before boarding the plane, I was like, have it. I'm going to Korea now. It's okay. So I think that's something that everyone who has ever been abroad can, can in a way relate to some of the administrative process yeah. and waiting and stress related to that. Now we have another question from Fiona Nong. She says, hello, David. Thank you for the inspiring presentation. Would you mind sharing with us one of your fun or memorable incidents studying abroad? Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah, so I, one I can think of right off the top of my head, I don't know if it's the best story, but um, so the first time when I came here in 2019, um, I was very spontaneously offered by some of my friends to go to New York with them. Um, and I had never been to New York. And of course, that's, you know, something that a lot of people, it's kind of one of the big things to do, right? Um, New York is like the big city in the United States. So I, I agreed to go. Um, but I think they never officially told me, but I think somebody else said no. So they tried to find somebody else so they can, don't have to pay. Um, so for me, it was a bit, you could tell it I wasn't really part of the group because I had a different flight and all that sort of stuff. So it was a bit challenging. And then my phone died as I was at the airport. So <laughs> I was kind of stuck in New York for like three hours, just trying to find my way. And then I was st standing next to like a hot dog stand to charge my phone. And then my friends, other friends came to pick me up that we were in New York at the same time. Um, so just this. And then I also, because I couldn't reach the other group that I was originally going with, so I slept at my friend's hotel rooms uh, on the floor. It was not ideal the first day in New York, but it was very, very, um, it's, it's a story. Like if I would have just gone there at the same flight, you know, went to the hotel, it would have not been as much of a cool story. And then also one thing that I personally just really liked, um, and it's the same when I go to Chicago where I'm at right now, um, it's, it's very, very small thing, but I always like when it happens is, um, so when I just walk around Chicago, and then let's say somebody sees me and they just ask, you know, like, hey, can you please tell me how can I get to this place? And same happened in New York. Like, hey, you know, uh, sir, can you please just tell me how I can get to the subway station? And obviously I have absolutely no idea because I'm not from here. I, I All I can tell them, like, yeah, sorry, you know, actually I have no idea. But it's just, for me personally, as an international student, it's, it's a great feeling if somebody asks me because that just means I, I seem like I fit in. So it's just like, oh, cool. This person th thought I just belong here, which is one thing I always find, like, it's just something, I, the feeling I like it of just, oh, this person thought I'm I'm a person here. So I kind of, as an international student, I, I seem to have made the transition to kind of fit in here, which is always, I think is a very, very nice feeling, even though it's just such a minor thing, but I always like that. Actually, it's not a minor thing, I believe. Thank you for your answer and thank you for your question, Fiona. But I would have to say that, like, one of the top three feelings in Korea to me is exactly what you just mentioned, <laughs> especially because in Korea, in many places, I do stand out like I'm taller than the others. And, you know, I, I on the outside, I don't look the same. So when like an Ajuma comes to me and actually asks me where something is, I literally jump of joy to, to see and I, I go out and about just to show her the directions because she gave me that trust to mm -hmm. ask me, not, not assuming that I'm a tourist, but assuming that I live here and that I know where the place is. So I can relate to that. And when it comes for the first story, wow, it, it was definitely not easy, but I, I would say that it's something that you're going to tell your grandchildren. <laughs> it feels like you have a lot of stories like that. Okay, our time is nearly up. So if anyone has another question or comment, please type it right now or unmute yourself. I can't see everyone. Is there anyone who would like to say something? If not, of course, I will do it because I always have a lot of questions, but I don't want to sound arrogant. <laughs> 
Taegyung Moon says, thank you, David. It was so informative. I definitely agree on that. So if we have no other questions, um, I would like to have one, <laughs> one last one. So I really also liked when you mentioned um, the differences between leaving your comfort zone, finding your comfort zone, expanding your comfort zone, because I never thought about it that way. But again, relying on some of my experiences, I did um, notice a change. It sounds a bit too harsh to say a change in my personality, but for example, it also relates to what you talked about um, living independently. You know, when you're at home, even if you live outside of home, you can call your parents to help or for advice or something. So I know back when I was in Serbia in my home country, I was so shy asking to ask things. Like if I go to a post office or a bank, I was always too shy to ask, but when you leave somewhere to, to another country, you have to ask. Yeah. <laughs> There's no other way. You have to ask, you have to, you know, be a bit more extroverted, I believe. So I did notice a big change in personality through my own experience. So my question to wrap this all up, how do you think this all changed you as a person and what changes in personality do you notice <laughs> if oh, there yeah. are some or you are always just... Uh, independent no, I, I, and open. <laughs> no, I completely agree with you. So uh, as I mentioned before, my major is computer science. So I'm more the introverted and kind of shy person usually. But um, especially when um, I came to the United States the first time, I kind of told myself, okay, in Germany, I'm shy. I don't talk much. I'm introverted. I'm just by myself. So now that I'm in the United States, I'm going to kind of reinvent myself and just try. I'm going to try to be more outgoing. I'm going to try to be more open, meet more people. Um, and, and I really did that. And it's it, kind of works because you know there's not there's nobody that knows you so you can really kind of try and even if it fails then you know you're never going to see these people again so it, I think for me just like you it's first off a lot of things I just had to do like if I want to get my bank account I just have to go to the bank by myself because there's no one else that can do it but then also um I could just I had the chance to kind of become a little bit more the way I sometimes wished I would be because you know sitting at home and they're like ah oh, you know maybe I should have said something today but when I came here I, I really tried and now it, did become more, I'm still, I mean, it didn't just change me completely. I'm still more introverted and, and still a little shy, but I definitely made big steps into being a bit more open. And then also just having, you know, friends from Korea, friends from Japan, friends from Brazil, just certain things that you just kind of pick up. Like I just noticed at some point that um, in Germany, when I say, hey, I just say, hello. And, and then a lot of my Korean friends, they always say like, hello, even if I'm just like, um, two meters away from them they just wave and now I, I just wave at everybody and some people look at me weird but that's just like a small thing I picked up that I personally just liked and so I started doing it and um, so it's, it's also small things like that but sometimes just you pick up and then afterwards you just notice like oh wow I, I just started doing this I think. <laughs> Wow, thank you for that as well it's really really interesting the way you described it and yes it is a we can say character, character changing experience and character enriching experience studying abroad, right? So to wrap it up, really thank you for your amazing presentation today. We have one more comment in the chat room from Professor Shin. He says, um, it is a nice question and comment describing the study abroad as a character changing experience. I think everyone who has ever been abroad or even done like some sort of online culture exchange could relate to that or could, yes, in a way relate to what David shared today with us through the GIC talk. Thank you once mm -hmm. again, David. Yeah, sure. Um, for this GIC talk, thank you everyone for joining today on this lovely Saturday afternoon to listen to the GIC talk studying abroad the best of experiences before we really finish this meeting as always I will announce our next week's talk and that is actually our monthly workshop with our lovely Dana Han let's agree to disagree listening circles some of you who have been regulars might know what um, the workshop, the monthly workshop is about. For those who would like to join for the first time, I will just say that if you have noticed that there are particular topics that everyone tries to avoid so that nobody argues and leaves the room, you're invited to bring all of those sensitive, controversial opinions to the Empathic Listening Circles workshop with 
Dana Han. Um, I wish you a lovely uh, Saturday evening. I wish you all a happy and healthy Tusa. I hope that you will stay safe, take care of your health, and be able to enjoy the holiday with your loved ones. My name is Jana, and this was another GIC Talk. Thank you so much. I will see you again next time. Goodbye. Thank mm -hmm. you.